Hello everyone, welcome to the third Kinesis 293 lecture. Today we'll be continuing on with our theme of political economy and specifically we're going to focus on the ways in which power has operated through the lens of gender. So I'm going to start with this video that will introduce us to our theme today. The idea of running long distance was always considered, you know, very questionable for women because, you know, an arduous activity would, would mean that you're going to get big legs and grow a mustache and hair on your chest and your uterus was going to fall out. So I filled out the entry form. I signed my name with my initials. I signed K.V. Switzer. And when I signed it that way, obviously, when the form went in, they couldn't tell it from a guy's. The world's most famous foot race even attracts a leggy lady, Kay Switzer of Syracuse. So there we were with my coach, Arnie Briggs, and my boyfriend, an All-American football player, Tom Miller. When other runners would come by, they would say, oh, it's a girl. And they were so excited. And Arnie was saying, yep. I've trained her. And all of a sudden, the flatbed truck is in front of us, and I heard the photographer saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. And they're taking pictures of us. On this truck was the race directors. One of them was a feisty character by the name of Jock Semple. He just stopped the bus, jumped off, and ran after me. Suddenly I turned, and he just grabbed me and screamed at me, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. And then he started clawing at me, starting trying to rip my numbers off. And I was so surprised. And he had the fiercest face of any guy I'd ever seen. And, and out of control, really. Um, I was terrified. And all of a sudden, my boyfriend, Big Tom, gave Jock the most incredible crossbody block and sent Jock flying. And all of this happened in front of the press truck. The journalist got very aggressive. What are you trying to prove? You know, are you a suffragette? Are you a crusader? Whatever that is, you know. And I said, what? I'm just trying to run. They finally left. Then it got very quiet. Snow's coming down. Nobody's saying anything. And I turned to Arnie. And I said, Arnie, you know, I've gotten you into a lot of mess here, I guess. But I said, I don't know where you stand in this. But I said, I'm going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if I have to because nobody believes that I can do this. And suddenly I realize, you know, if I don't finish this race, then everybody's gonna believe women can't do it and that they don't deserve to be here and that they're incapable. I've got to finish this race. I finished in four hours, 20 minutes. That race changed my life. It wasn't until about midnight when we were driving back from Boston to Syracuse University and we stopped on the throughway to get an ice cream and some coffee. Um, to we see the newspapers and the covered front and back of all the different editions with the pictures. I realized that now this was very, very important and this is, was going to change my life and it was probably going to change women's sports. Now, remember that this was the 1970s. This wasn't no 1800s or Victorian America where we have this kind of clear conception of gendered inequality. This was probably in your parents' lifetime. So this stuff is going on pretty recent. And today we're going to argue that Catherine Switzer's experience was kind of a typical culmination of a lot of the common gendered ideologies that have manifested throughout the history of physical culture. So what we're going to do is ask the question of who has sport historically been for? And we're going to continue on with the theme of how political domination has determined who has access to physical culture and who has not. Arguing that in the process, physical culture has never been this neutral plane in which everybody can experience it and enjoy it and has equal access to it. Last week, we talked about how the concept of amateurism has operated through political domination to exclude people of a certain class basis from sport historically. And today we're going to argue that 
gender has operated in a similar way, and that gendered ideologies that exist in broader society have seeped into sport and have shaped the experience of women and men in sport. So that's what we're going to argue today. We're going to investigate why that's been the case, and then kind of the specific practices in which gender has manifested in physical culture. So as I said, we're going to look at the institutional segregation within sport, the gender politics, and then sport as a masculine space and kind of the influence of women once they get into this masculine space. So we'll start by talking about structures of domination and throw a little theory at you before we get into the specifics. So when we talk about political domination and we talk about how power operates, it's important to know that um, it doesn't always operate in the same way, in the kind of same um, predictable manner that we like to think it does. So traditionally, that's how we view power, that we have this one overarching theory of power and that it always determines our outcomes. And this is where we get a lot of academic um, fields that view power in this way. So for example, Marxist studies, they think that one aspect of identity, class, is determinant of everything. So when they ask where power comes from, what shapes our experiences, they say, okay, well, in some way it's class, it's the economy, it's capitalism. Everything in some way can be traced back to class. Whereas people in the field of African American studies or critical race studies would say that everything comes back to race that in some way our life's experiences are all shaped by our race. Women's studies would say everything comes back to gender, everything comes back to patriarchy. Queer studies would say sexuality, right? Heterosexuality, homosexuality shapes our experiences. Now, of course, I'm characterizing these and these are kind of prototypes, but this is traditionally how academia has viewed power. And we're going to take a different view, and that's, we're going, to, we're going to take the view of intersectionality, which I'm sure by now is a word that you've probably heard, but essentially it's very simple. All it means is that one of these aspects of identity, class, race, gender, whatever else you want to think about, it's not one independent, isolated factor that shapes people's experiences. Instead, all of these different identity factors and all of these different contexts and circumstances intersect to create one's experience. So power operates through all of these different things in all of these different ways. Not always in the same magnitude, not always at the same time, but somehow, some way, they intersect. So for example, let's take three women's tennis players, all very famous, all had wildly different experiences. Althea Gibson was a black woman and her experience in physical culture was much different than Chris Evert, who was a straight white woman, who had a much different experience than Martina Navratilova, who was a white woman but also was homosexual. All three had very different, all three were women, right, but because of different, here we're just looking at race and sexuality, not even thinking about class and other things, all had very different experiences. And one other thing I want to mention before we get into it is the fact that when we, we talk about power operating, it's important to establish that power operates institutionally. So when people talk about sexism, right, a lot of people think, oh, sexism is when men are mean to women or rude to women or discriminate against women, right? They view it as this kind of interpersonal matter, right, that, that manifests in like slurs or, or prejudice or something like that, right? But people make the argument that with power, sexism, racism, all these other different things, it operates institutionally, right? It doesn't rely just on personal people in their heart being racist, being sexist, right? If we snapped our finger and all the racists and all the sexists in the world were no longer racist and sexist, we would still have these barriers that still lead to differential outcomes. 
So the point being is that when we talk about race and sex mattering and kind of all these, you know, other identity issues that I'm not trying to marginalize, it operate the oppression operates through institutions, not just a personal matter. So it's deeper, it's structural, it's more than one person's bad heart or bad attitude. And this institutional oppression can happen either de jure or de facto. De jure meaning by rule, by law, de facto meaning by norm or by social expectation. So we're going to talk about these a little bit later, but I just wanted to bring them up. Okay, so let's talk about the history of gender apartheid and physical culture. And first, I want to start with the history of gender apartheid um, in American society more generally, right? Throughout American history, men and women have been in separate spheres, as we know, right? And have had, because of that, different gendered norms and expectations. Men were the ones in the public sphere, employment, military, politics. Women were in the private sphere, at home, in the kitchen, so to speak, um, the guardians of morality. Things like that, right? So men around the open, women were more private. And so with men in this public sphere included sport. Now, there were some public spheres that at the turn of the, the 19th century were these kind of um, places where men could express their masculinity, shape their masculinity, just kind of good old fashioned show off, right? Make themselves feel manly. One of them was the frontier, right? Kind of the Western frontier where you go West and settle some land and lasso some horses or something. And you feel like a man, right? Um, more insidious, kill Native Americans. Um, but this was kind of the history of the frontier. That was the subtext, right? So at the turn of the century, though, we already go West. There's no more West to go. There's no more frontier to go. So the frontier is closing. War, right, has always been a public sphere where men were able to hone their masculinity, right? Our country has been at war for, I think it's 227 out of our 241 years now. Um, we like war, right? And especially men like to show off um, their masculinity through war. So in the 1800s, we have the Civil War, and that's kind of our big one. And then we go through a period where we're not really at war anymore until, I guess you could argue, 1898 with the Spanish-American War, which wasn't much of a war. But So war is kind of closing down at the turn of the century, right? So there's this kind of crisis about, okay, no more frontier, no more war. How are our men going to know that they're men? Or how are they going to signal that they're masculine enough? And this is where physical culture stepped in, right? People saw that sport and physical culture was one way in which men could demonstrate their masculinity, right? Demonstrate these things, these attributes that make a man a man, right? Aggression, discipline, determination, endurance, bravery, leadership, strength, physical strength, strength of character, all these things that make men manly, right? Hopefully you can hear in the tone of my voice that I kind of have this sarcastic tone that I'm not saying that this is like actually true or good. Um, yeah. But I'm just kind of trying to explain this, right? So physical culture, just to establish this, has always been a male space, right? It's always been a space for men. This is something that we kind of intuitively understand. And even today, you know, it's kind of hard to argue that sport is not a male thing more than it's a female thing. Um, but throughout our history, it's been kind of an only male space, right? And men have always had greater access to resources, greater representation, greater participation. And so because sport was seen as a manly thing, right, women were often excluded from it, as we know, right, for a lot of reasons. But People thought that women participating in physical culture was a problem for a number of reasons that we'll get into in a second. But kind of at the forefront, people believed that 
what sport would do is kind of masculinize women, right? They had these established gender roles where men were one type of attribute and women were um, another type of attributes, right? And if a woman, if a woman showed strength or bravery or determination, right, that was bad. Because now we're mixing the gender roles and society is going to go into chaos and everything will be bad if a woman, a woman throws a football, right? So throughout the 1800s and 1900s, we have these very rigid gender roles. And the, thought, the, the thinking was that if women are able to play sports, these gender roles will break down. Women will become masculinized and start to learn some of these traits that only men should have, right? And I should say, um, before we go any further, that these were not just kind of these um, neutral differences, right? Where it was, oh, men are just one thing, women are just another. They're just different by nature, right? Well, in some ways, that may be true. It was This was often always done in a manner to hierarchize these differences, right? It was not just neutral. It was that men have these attributes like strength, bravery, courage, determination, leadership, all things that sound good, right? Whereas women, they're just different. They have meekness and frailty and they're really nice and moral and ethical. But like, so point being, right, that there was a, a clear hierarchy in these gender differences and that having these rigid gender roles served men more than it served women, right? Served to oppress women. So, as McDonough and Papineau argue, right, the gender apartheid in sport was justified around three eyes. Hopefully you caught this from the reading. Inferiority, injury, and immorality. We'll break these down a little bit more. So first, infe inferiority. This was the justification that women can't play sports because they're just inferior to men. Physically especially, but people even thought um, mentally, right? That was in the subtext. But there was always this kind of idea that no matter what, physically, men are just better than women. In every physical aspect, since sport is a physical thing, men are better than them, they should play, was the thinking, right? And we even see this today, right? Not, not necessarily to create an apartheid in sport, but just the fact of, you know, those kind of, every kid in gym class, it's, oh, I could beat a woman in anything, right? And they're always kind of like the least athletic kid in gym, and they talk the most crap about blah, blah, blah. But there's always this kind of belief that, Anything physical, a man is just better than a woman, right? So it's not something that's gone away today. But historically, this has been even more entrenched. And it led to gender verification testing, or sex testing, as it's called. Um, and we're going to get into this a little bit later in the course, but essentially what this was was that in order to compete in the Olympics, especially in a couple other um, institutions, women basically had to go through these very invasive and embarrassing tests to prove that they were women, that men didn't have to go through to prove that they were men. But if you wanted to compete in women's sports, basically what women, what women had to do was present themselves naked to judges, right? Often these old men that would basically look at their genitalia and determine for themselves if they were woman enough to be considered a woman in sport, right? First, it started as a visual inspection. Then it turned to a um, touchy inspection, gropey inspection. I can't think of a more sophisticated word for that. Um, a trumpy inspection, let's say. And then later, it turned into a chromosomal inspection, right, where they take, like, a DNA swab. Um, and so this was obviously problematic for a lot of reasons that we'll get into later. It was just complete pseudoscience and, and, and dehumanizing. But essentially the point behind it was that we need to prove our women are women enough because if they are 
manly at all, if they have any sort of masculinity in them, they have an unfair advantage. Because the logic was that any masculinity was correlated with better performance. Which is not true. But we see this ideology manifesting itself in very problematic ways in physical culture. If you pass this visual gropey chromosomal inspection, you got your woman card that proved that you were a woman and that you could compete. As you can see, that doesn't say 1950, whatever, that says 1998. That's how late the practice went. So that's inferiority, right? Injury, the second I. This was the justification that sport was just dangerous for women because women are more prone to injury. They're more fragile than men are, right? They're the, since they're the physically inferior sex, they're weak, and even more insidious, they're ruled by kind of their reproductive system. The scientific explanation for this was that um, because of women's menstruation, their cyclical functioning, that led them to becoming, that led other parts of their body to being weaker than that of men, right? So this was the mechanism that they pointed to that said they're weaker because they expend all their energy and vulnerability to reproduce or possibly reproduce, whereas men don't have that. They can just play sports, be strong, things of that sort, right? So this was seen as evidence of bad health, fatigue, um, mood swings, right? And all these other things that basically they said, okay, because of that, we can't let our women play sports because they might get injured, they're weaker, and most importantly, we can't have them mess up their reproductive capability, which the majority of men at that time thought was basically the only role for a woman. And so because of injury, we get early women's sport um, going under moderation. By this we mean that they would, when they did allow women to play sports, finally, it was a moderated form of sport, right? So a lot of sports were uh, modified to make sure that the woman uh, was less likely to get injured, that they weren't exerting as much energy, it, it wasn't as aggressive, there was um, less physical contact, right? For example, early 1900 women's basketball was not the basketball that we know now, as they talked about in the Khan article. There was no physical contact prohibit, or, or there was no physical contact, I'm sorry. They couldn't touch each other. They had assigned zones that they had to stay in. They can only dribble three times. And basically, this wasn't a rule, but it was more about the social aspect to get women talking and to get women um, socializing with each other rather than who won. They didn't even keep score for a while, right? So you can see here this idea that, okay, we're going to let women play sports, but we have to make sure to moderate it, right? We can't let them touch each other. We can't let them um, run all over the court because they'll get tired. We have to only let them dribble three times, things like that. The idea being is that they're weaker, and this will lessen the likelihood that they'll be injured, right? It's something that we still see today in a lot of sports, right, where the idea is that women can't go as long or have less endurance than men, which is why we see women's basketball having a shorter game than men's basketball, shorter quarters. We have of course, women's lacrosse not having checking, women's hockey not having checking. Um, you could go up and down the list of sports that have men and women's sports, and you'll often find some sort of rule that is based on the fact that women just aren't as strong or more likely to get injured, and therefore we have to moderate it for them. The third I was immorality. And this one was kind of just... You know, this feeling that men had that said, well, it's just not a woman's place to play sport, right? This one was more kind of strictly psychologically um, about the gender roles, right? It was seen as unbecoming of a woman to make them do the masculine thing of playing sports, right? And also, there was this idea that if you made them play sports, that's not really a sexual act, Right? I can't be turned on by women playing sports, which throughout a lot of history um, 
was what men saw as the main role of women, right? To turn them on, to be um, a possible mate to reproduce with, right? So if they weren't doing that, men thought, well, why play sport, right? And even further than that, a lot of people thought that masculinizing women and making them play these masculine sports would turn them into lesbians, right? Something that, sadly, we still hear today. And so the women that did play sports, right, um, they were often called immodest, unladylike, right, said that their behavior wasn't good um, and that they needed to stop playing sports and go do more ladylike things, right? However, we also get this paradox of when they are playing sports, right, they're often shaped to be these objects for the male gaze, Right, they have these kind of uniforms that showed off their legs, showed off whatever, right? So there was this element of trying to get men to look at them, or at least appeal to men, right? These flashy and revealing outfits. Something that was present at the beginning of women's participation in physical culture and still is today. And like I said, there was always this fear, this unfounded fear that allowing women to play sports would turn them into homosexuals, right? Or, or not even that, just make them less attractive to men, um, which, like I said, men thought was their only role. And so, while these have certainly shaped the experience of um, women in physical culture, inferiority, injury, and immorality. Um, I want to make this, again, like I said, an intersecting kind of analysis. So women, of, of course, were generally barred from a lot of sport, um, but there were levels to it. Upper class white women often had um, the highest amount of freedom and autonomy. They were often allowed in um, more physical cultural spaces than other women, right? Now, it probably didn't, you know, they probably still had the same concerns about homosexuality and still had to wear these kind of flashing and revealing outfits to have that sexuality component, but they had more access, right? Um, in the 19th century, when women's sports started to um, become a thing, they had these country clubs for golf, tennis, and other ladylike sports that upper-class white women uh, were able to access. However, non-upper-class women were excluded from these based on affordability, while non-white women were excluded based on race, right? So this is what intersection looks like, how all these different identities, it wasn't just one experience as a woman, there were various experiences as a woman, as a middle-class, lower-class woman, a black woman, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? So next I want to dig a little bit deeper into the logics of um, the gendered apartheid and some of the paradoxes that we see. So all throughout women's sports, or all throughout sports, right, male sports, we're very familiar with this idea of winning at all costs. All that matters is the score. That's all people remember. That is the point of the game is to win, right? Anyone who's played sports knows that. But female sports historically weren't about winning, right? They were about safety, socialization, sex appeal, femininity, as I've just described, right? Winning was certainly an afterthought. So you can see how it's hard to get women's sports to be respected if winning kind of isn't seen as the point to the extent that it is for men. And so we get women's sports being looked down on as an inferior game, something that's not taken seriously, right? Partially because it's structured not to be taken seriously, but people, you know, often flip it around and say, well, it's just not entertaining as men's sports, right? And so we get this kind of image of what we call the contradictory female athlete from this, right? Athletes who are supposed to compete at the highest levels, Right, and achieve these things and make their sport fun to watch and achieve 
all these accolades, right? Well, at the same time, the only way they'll be accepted if they do so is to conform to the expectations of femininity, right? Many of which are unrealistic. And so throughout the history of women in physical culture, you get this constant tension, right, of being good at your sport, but also being feminine, right? They're not mutually exclusive, but they're often viewed as if they are, right? Just one example, Serena Williams. Okay, an easy example. I know we probably all remember this cartoon, um, but Serena Williams, contradictory female athlete, right? She is at the top of her game, probably one of the most remarkable female athletes ever, but at the same time isn't accepted for many ways because of her body, because of the ways in which people interpret her as not conforming to um, the kind of set expectation of femininity that our society and culture has, right? So just looking at this, we can see the contrast here. She's looked at as throwing a tantrum. She's big and muscular and, and specifically drawn to not fit this feminine ideal, whereas Osaka, on the other hand, right, who is not a blonde white woman, of course, um, but is seen as this small, thin, unassuming, polite woman um, that we're supposed to identify with. So I've talked about oppression. I've talked about the operation of power, right? But of course, there's also resistance, right? A lot of women have been successful in kind of shaping how people understand uh, women within physical culture. And so a case study of this is Babe Diedrichson, right? She was one of the first really good women athletes. She was a track and field athlete and a golf athlete, won 82 golf tournaments, including against men, five Olympic medals in track and field, also played baseball, softball, tennis, diving, bowling, billiards, boxing. She did everything. And she did this as kind of a normal woman, right? She was, in all other respects, she was normal, she was straight, she was just a normal person, right? But because she was just in these sporting spaces, she was seen as the antithesis of femininity. A famous sports writer, as you can see here, the quote says, it would be much better if she and her ilk stayed at home, got themselves pretty, prettied up, and waited for the phone to ring. Right? So it didn't matter how much stuff she did, how good she was, the level of achievement that she reached, she was still just seen as a woman that should go home, wait for the phone to ring, and accept her place. However, she did start to get greater acceptance after she married um, a professional wrestler in 1938, right? So here she kind of signals her femininity and because people are kind of comfortable say oh she's a married woman maybe she'll be a housewife she starts to be accepted more she conforms to the traditional standards of femininity so world war ii was kind of an important point to look at um, in the history of gender relations more broadly than physical culture so what happened was when all the men went off to war, the women were the ones that um, filled the factories and went to work. So prior, when they were seen as these housewives that needed to stay home and tend to the house, well, the husband, the breadwinner worked. When all the husbands went off to war, the women were the ones that basically kept the war economy and the domestic economy going. And in this, it signaled that women basically can work just as well as men can, right? So it kind of opened the eyes of the nation. And during this, we see kind of somewhat significant strides in gender relations because of this realization. Uh, in 1943, we get the formation of the All-American Girls Baseball League, right? So it started to become, to become accepted uh, that women could play sports. And even to the point where it was an entire league where 
They traveled around and played actual games that they kept the score of. Shocker, right? However, it's a little darker than that. As I said, with access also comes um, the relegation to gendered expectations, right? So the league chief executive was good in that he kind of formed this women's baseball league, but it also was kind of a... Um, pervy endeavor as he he very much tried to make it about beauty as well and so the movie a league of their own um talks about this baseball league this actually isn't the movie this is a documentary from a documentary about on the home front they find them everywhere north east south and west and even canada Players for the new All-American Girls Baseball League. After the first month of league play, the shine still isn't off these diamond gals. Alice Skeeter Gasper says legging out a triple is no reason to let your nose get shiny. Betty Grable has nothing on these gals. Helen Haley has not only been a member of several championship amateur teams, she's also an accomplished coffee maker. With her husband in the Pacific, Betty Horn enjoys cooking spaghetti and knitting. Her teammates call her Betty Spaghetti. Helen Sue Gotlander is a former Miss Georgia. Yo. Then there's pretty Dottie Hinson, who plays like Gehrig and looks like Garbo. Uh-uh, fellas, keep your mitts to yourself. She's married. And there's her kid sister, Kit, who's as single as they come. Enough concentrated oomph for a whole carload of Hollywood starlets. And how about Marla Hooch? What a hitter. What a lead. But girls playing baseball? Very cringy, right? Uh, that was a serious ad for the baseball league. So, well, there is progress. Um, as you can see, World War II era, a lot of work to go, right? But encapsulates the experience um, that a lot of women had to go through in order to get access. So World War II ends. All the men come back. They say, hey, give me my job back. And they get it. And the women go back to their role quote-unquote. And so what we get is this process of trying to re-feminize America. Re-feminize meaning make women seem like women again. Um, get them to stop working and having their own freedom and autonomy. And basically try to make them into this ideal feminine image again. Right? Um, so here's where we get kind of the 1950s, 1960s era suburban housewife. Someone who tends to the home, well, the breadwinner, again, um, makes the money and comes back home, right? But after getting a little taste of their own freedom and the working world, a lot of women don't accept this image. They don't want this role. So we get the advent of the women's liberation movement. They get fed up, right? And so in the 60s, as we know, a decade of intense activism where people were starting to rightfully take what they felt like they were owed, we see women start to fight for um, rights that a lot of people didn't realize that they didn't even have, right? The right to work, the right to be equal, uh, the right to divorce if they needed to, all these different things coalesce in this women's liberation movement. And so sport was one of the areas um, in which women's liberation movement really looked to um, as not only a site of resistance, but of a site that could be a microcosm of broader equality in the world, right? Sporting spaces were um, targeted as this mechanism um, that reproduced patriarchy because um, while men were able to be in these physical cultural spaces, they were able to um, gain power through networking and, and through kind of constructing this image of the ideal American where women were excluded from that. 
All right, so what else is going on in 1960s, kind of context of this women's liberation movement? Employment opportunities, right? There's a glass ceiling that even though some women are starting to work, they're not able to get promotions. They're all things like secretaries and um, basically just excluded from high status, high paying professions that men have. Educational opportunities, um, they're not being allowed to gain an education, specifically a higher education at the same rate that men are. As you can see, in 1972, women only received 7% of law degrees, 9% of medical de degrees, 1% of dental degrees, despite being over 50% of the population. Legal protections, um, autonomy, right? Until the mid-70s, for example, a husband could not be convicted of raping his wife. So they wanted to not be at the mercy of their husband, right? They wanted legal protections separate from the men in their life, if need be, to be recognized as their own people, not just a vestige of who they marry. They wanted reproductive rights. They didn't have um, rights to their own contraception, birth control. Um, we get Roe versus Wade in the early 70s. So there was a big push over um, the extent to which women should have freedom to reproduce as they see fit. And, of course, financial opportunities, right? This also stemmed from being seen as the second half of a man, but a woman, for example, could not get a credit card in her own name without approval from her husband. So this is the context of the, the liberation movement, and they sought to end all of this uh, discrimination that they saw. And like I said, sport became an important site for contestation. Specifically, in 1972, we get the passage of Title IX. And this was a large moment in not only the history of gender relations, but the history of sport as well. It said that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational programs or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So Title IX was a broad sweeping legislation. It aimed mostly at education. It basically said that women need to have the same amount of resources and same opportunity and same funding in the educational system as men do. Right? And so while that's included, well, that was mainly focused on academics, right? It also included sport. It included college athletics as well. And because of this, the NCAA lobbied against it, right? Or they lobbied for an exemption saying that if we have to start funding women's sports, then we won't be able to exist, right? Amateurism is, isn't enough, but we can't fund women as much as we fund men because people won't watch it. Because people have all these preconceived notions basically making the you know kind of stupid arguments that we talked about earlier the executive director at this time said that title IX would be the possible doom of intercollegiate sports as resources were shifted away from men's sports to support female athletics so despite all their crying right it passed and of as we know now as we talked about last week ncaa is a billion dollar industry certainly was not the possible doom right so a lot of just BS, but as you can see, people resisted this. And it was not just this economic thing as well. It was also from the three eyes, right? The fact that it was immoral um, for women to do this, right? It, they saw it as um, the downfall of society if we're going to masculinize women. Also on another plane, Little League Baseball, right? Little League Baseball formed in the post-war era of the 50s, and it explicitly banned women from competing, but in 73, um, inspired one year later from Title IX, uh, there was a case brought forward by the parents of Maria Pepe that basically challenged the gendered segregation of Little League Baseball, saying that it prohibited anti-discrimination rules. And so what happened was Maria Pepe um, 
was a very good Little League player. She tried out for a team and was better than a lot of the boys um, and basically just wanted to play baseball. But essentially what happened is her coach allowed her to play, but when she went to uh, their team, went to play other teams, those teams um, threatened to quit, said they wouldn't play against a girl, basically said that if you want to stay in this league, you can't have a girl on your team or we're about to snitch. And so basically Maria Pepe's parents, like I said, um, filed this lawsuit. And essentially they won, right? There was no argument because gendered segregation in Little League Baseball um, was against anti-discrimination laws that we had. So despite this, though, it, so in 74, it opened Little League Baseball to women. Um, but what they did was create a parallel institution called softball, right? Literally softball. Um, as you know, there's certainly nothing soft about the ball, so it's curious where the name came from. Um, but, well, it didn't stipulate that men play baseball, women play softball. It was kind of a de, de facto separation um, where a lot of women chose softball while a lot of the boys played baseball. Right? Another significant event in the, in the backdrop of the women's liberation movement was the Battle of the Sexes. So in 1973, um, old tennis player Bobby Riggs, right, um, basically he went around saying that he could beat any woman, right, and he challenged the top women, the top female tennis players basically just to make a point that men are superior to women. And the top player at this time was Billie Jean King. So she was the best women's player and activist, um, a feminist, right? Someone who was very involved in the community. First female athlete to earn six figures in a year. Bobby Riggs repeatedly challenged her to a match, saying, I can beat the best female tennis player. And repeatedly challenged her, and Billie Jean King kept saying, no, she's not going to subject herself to that. Um, so Riggs played some other women and beat them, right? Beat another top ranked women's player, Margaret Court in straight sets. And so then Billie Jean King decided, okay, I got to shut this dude up, right? And accepted to, um, accepted to a match with Riggs. Contradictions were the rule where the women's liberation movement was concerned. For example, by autumn of 73, 30 states had ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, but opposition to the ERA was growing stronger and often it came from women. However, in September, this complex pursuit of power was reduced to a moment of hand-to-hand -hand combat Hollywood style. The gladiators were played by an aging rooster and an angry woman. The part of the Coliseum was played by the Astrodome. The audience was played by us all. Live from the Astrodome in Houston, Texas, the tennis battle of the sexes, Billy Jean King versus Bobby Riggs. Any ball you can hit, I can hit harder. I can hit any ball harder. No, if I had to bet money, I would bet on Bobby Riggs. I'd have to give him the edge over Billy Jean. I think Billy Jean. You do? Yeah. The male is king, the male is supreme. I said it over and over again. I still feel that way. Girls play a nice game of tennis for girls. But when they get out there on a court with a man, even a tired old man of 55, they're going to be in big trouble. I had to prove that women athletes are good, that tennis is a great sport, and help people to understand that gender is not as big a deal as people think. It may seem like an inappropriate place to hold a tennis match, but actually it could not have been more appropriate since this tennis match seemed more like a Super Bowl. I know. I was here covering it that night. On one side, you had Bobby Riggs fans yelling, kill, kill. On the other side, you had Billie Jean King fans yelling, a boy, Billie Jean. It happened this way. Men and women did not get equal prize money in tennis, not then. Bobby Riggs went public and said women didn't deserve equal prize money. Billie Jean King took him on wasn't just a matter of equal pay, it was a matter of recognition. 
a matter of closing the muscle gap. You are my love and my light. You are my inspiration. Just you and me. Billy Jean King, calm and composed. I thought I was going to throw up. I was so nervous. I really felt horrible. She gave me the cutest little pig you ever saw, right? You know what I did with that pig? I sent it down to Oklahoma on a farm, and when it grew up to be a great big uh, uh, hog, I was going to send the back here, but I never got the chance. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's a game. And no, it's no game. Among King's supporters are three college athletes who've come from Wisconsin. One of them is Lynn Riggs. And it was great, and you were just, you were participating in it. You know, she was playing the match, but you were there. You were in it. She was playing the match for all of us. We both wanted to win so bad, but in this match, there was so much tension there that I tired out much faster than I normally did. I got in great shape. I mean, I was in unbelievable shape. So we had the battle of the two Supremes there, and you came out on top. You got to have to congratulate you on that. Thank you, I was supposed to Thank be you, good dear. at that myself. <laughs> a lot of women did believe in themselves more after that. I went to a Philadelphia newspaper two days after that, and they stood up and clapped, and they ran up to me and said, we finally had enough guts to ask for a raise. I said, great, because if you feel that way, then you better go in and, and be direct about it. And they said, you know what, Billy, we got it. We got the raise, but we would have never had the courage to go and ask if you hadn't beaten Bobby Riggs. Now it's a new game, and Bobby Riggs doesn't have a sporting chance. This little piggy was a Bobby Riggy piggy, direct from the Astrodome. This is not a subject to be ignored by Maude, TV's toughest woman. Well, I don't believe that I just heard that. You can't do this to me. You've got to accept my estate. Sorry, sweetheart. You had your chance, and like Bobby Riggs, you blew it. <laughs>